it's seven o'clock and um, Thursday evening and traditionally I'm saying welcome to you all thank you for joining us and uh, please introduce yourself in the chat box and tell us a little bit about yourself uh, where you are in the world what are you doing professionally and why you've decided to join us tonight it is always really really good to read your messages in the chat box today we have um, a one and a kind uh, uh, session and Paul uh, Grantham in a minute will introduce our presenter who has actually never presented in the UK and uh, Jeff uh, was going to come and do his first ever UK seminar for us in June but uh, unfortunately our plans had to be corrected but he will still be doing this first ever in the UK seminar for us in June but from home from the USA but uh, I won't tell you everything I will leave something uh, for Paul to tell you so I'll uh, unmute Paul just one second Paul you need to give me a moment to do that and uh, Your microphone, yeah, that's that's all fine. So Paul is unmuted, and I'll pass the microphone to Paul to introduce our speaker. Welcome, folks, and um, thanks again for coming along in uh, not such brilliant weather where we are in the UK at the moment. It's um, the uh, the sunny weather that we've actually had around for the last few days um, has sadly disappeared. Um, but we have got some exciting things this evening, uh, which I hope will raise your spirits. Um, we are going to be hearing a talk in a minute from Dr. Jeff Riggenbach. Now, Jeff is uh, based in Oklahoma, which is where he will be leading this talk from uh, today. Um, there's quite a big time difference as well between Oklahoma and here, so um, it's, uh, it's probably less of a challenge uh, for the talk tonight, but I do actually understand that when he leads um, the two-day event that he's doing with us on the 25th and the 26th of June, it is going to mean he's going to have to start at something like 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so um, fantastic commitment for which we are um, phenomenally pleased. But I hope you're going to get um, a flavor of some of the interesting things that he's got to offer um, because Jeff is actually, in my opinion, one of the few people who has got a specialist knowledge and interest in the whole area of CBT and personality disorder. So whether or not you work with PD clients, um, I'm sure a number of you have got clients who demonstrate to some degree personality issues which head towards the more um, difficult and the more challenging end of the spectrum. Um, if you've got clients, for example, who have difficulties with distress tolerance or who are particularly challenging or are quite chaotic uh, or difficult to engage, um, then I'm sure that there's going to be some really interesting ideas that Jeff will be able to share with us uh, today and which he will be able to elaborate on in much more detail on the 25th and the 26th if you've not already signed up for that. He is the author of two best-selling books in the field, uh, The Cognitive Behaviour Therapy Toolbox, a workshop, uh, sorry, workshop, a workbook for clients and, and, uh, and clinicians, and also the Borderline Personality Disorder Toolbox, um, a practical evidence-based guide for regulating um, emotions and distress. Um, those, both of those books, by the way, are available um, on Amazon um, if you're interested in taking this particular idea forward. Um, but I'm going to leave it to one side at the moment, apart from probably to add um, on a personal note that um, I have noticed, I guess, with my own clients, uh, particularly since lockdown started, 
that um, really difficulties which did not present uh, previously um, began to present as a result of uh, the, the pandemic problems that we've actually got at the moment. So um, for all of us, I think we're going to have some really useful practical information. And it's over to you, Jeff. Yes, you're unmuted, Jeff. Welcome. Okay, you unmuted me. All right. Did the work for me there. All right. I didn't have to do the technology. That's great. All right. Well, thank you. Professor Grantham for that, uh, those kind words of introduction. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here with you and share for just 20 or 30 minutes or so here today, this evening, I guess, for most of you, on the topic of dealing with difficult clients during a pandemic. Uh, we got kind of a limited time here, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. I always start these trainings by asking, well, what do we really mean when we talk about a difficult client? I mean, what does a difficult client or a difficult person look like? I guess you could uh, shoot your answers in the chat box there. It's a little more difficult to interact here, but yeah, go ahead and shoot those to me. In the live trainings, I have people come up with all kinds of different uh, answers to this question, some of which are not necessarily fit to be broadcast here, uh, but people have different ideas as to what they mean when they think of a difficult client or a difficult person. I oftentimes half jokingly say that difficult people are, really might be defined as the people that do the things we don't want them to do and the people that don't do the things we do want them to do. <laughs> so that's half joking, of course, but I always remember back in graduate school when I heard some of my first training on diagnosing personality disordered individuals. And the professor says, you not liking the patient is not grounds for diagnosing a personality disorder. Uh, you not liking the patient is called transference. And that's always sort of stuck in my mind all these years. And I was joking with somebody the other day. I said, I think if I were an alien that just landed on this planet for the first time and got on social media, I would think that 50% of the population on this planet used to be in a relationship with somebody called a narcissist. And I joke a little bit, but I did a little bit of research and there's over 300 Facebook groups and pages devoted to things like you know, healing from narcissistic abuse and living with a narcissist and recovering from these relationships. And I mean, I, I don't mean to, to undermine anybody's experience because certainly people with narcissistic traits can be abusive and have, have harmed a lot of people. I mean, but the reality is, according to our statistics anyway, anywhere from 1% to 5% of the general population actually qualifies for clinical narcissism. Uh, so there can't be that many of these people running around out there. And so the bottom line is it's a lot easier for us to call somebody else a name than it is for us to sort of recognize our own role in an interaction or a problematic relationship. So whenever I give a talk on dealing with difficult clients, I always like to preface it by saying that. And hopefully we can kind of keep this in the back of our minds as we talk about different client groups, as we think about different client groups. Having said all that, there are people that uh, are just difficult. They're not just difficult for you, but they're difficult for everybody. Uh, anybody have a difficult client on your caseload? Uh, shoot it in the chat there. Let me see how many people here deal with the difficult clients on a regular basis. Uh, what, what about in your personal life? Anybody work with a difficult coworker? And may, maybe you uh, have a difficult roommate or somebody in your family. Okay, so difficult people really show up in a number of different areas in life. I'm getting yes, 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 yes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, these difficult people uh, really do show up in multiple areas of our life. And so I think it's important that we define what we're talking about here. I always think of difficult people having kind of five characteristics in common. And the first one has to do with, with very strong beliefs. Difficult people have very deeply held beliefs. You may hear different clinical terminology, deeply ingrained beliefs, deeply encrusted beliefs. Uh, the schema therapy term would say they have highly compelling schemas. So uh, beliefs have kind of become popular these days. I actually attended a leadership conference, not even a clinical conference, but a leadership conference uh, just before the pandemic shut everything down. And I had a guy at my table that was a business coach and he was trying to tell everybody uh, how, you know, beliefs drive behavior, beliefs drive behavior. I heard this over and over. And so as I'm talking to this guy, it became pretty clear he didn't have much of an understanding of what he was talking about. Uh, so I always like to try to explain these things in very practical down to earth terms. 
You know, and I've given a few of these talks on difficult people, difficult clients in the last two, three months since Easter. And so I was thinking about uh, back Easter, I was kind of reminiscing uh, to Easter's past of my childhood. And I don't know what Easter's like uh, in your culture, wherever you live, uh, but where we grew up, Easter was always, Easter morning was always one of the most exciting mornings of the year. Uh, we would have the Easter bunny would come, and so we'd get baskets, and we'd get eggs. And I remember one morning, I was probably eight or nine, I woke up early, and, and I realized it was Easter, and the anticipation was killing me, so I raced into the front room, would have turned around to the couch, um, got in front of the fireplace where we normally get the eggs and the baskets, and there was no eggs and no baskets. And I thought, oh my gosh, maybe the Easter Bunny's kind of mixing it up a little this year. And so maybe he's hid the baskets downstairs in the basement. So I raced down to the basement. I turned the corner. No eggs, no baskets. I think maybe my sisters beat me to the punch this year. So I race up the stairs. I go into her bedroom. I hang a left. No eggs, no baskets. I mean, I start... Uh, freaking out. I'm, I'm sticking my head under the bed. I'm crawling into strange places. I think he went out to the barn. I mean, so if you just watched, a, had a videotape rolling of all these things that I did, I mean, they look completely nonsensical. Chris Podesky is famous for saying, you know, people do things for good reasons. You know, why did I do all those crazy looking things from the outside? Okay. Because I believed in that furry little rabbit. Now, a year or two later, once I was sort of on to the secret, uh, my parents couldn't drag me out of bed at 10 o'clock to try to get me to go to church. So my behavior changed significantly, but only when the belief changed. And so I could talk for a half a day seminar on beliefs only. I don't have time to do that here today. But I just really think it's important to recognize beliefs drive all of this. Beliefs drive all of the difficult client groups I'm going to talk about in the two-day training here in a few weeks. Beliefs really drive all these other principles we're going to talk about here briefly today that, that, that make clients difficult. The Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung is famous for saying, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will drive our lives and we will call it fate. And I thought that was powerful the first time I heard it, but particularly working with these client groups, I always get people coming in saying things like, oh, you know, karma's really kicking me in the butt today, or oh, you know, just my luck. This always happens to me. Almost always, uh, the results, the situations that they're in can be tracked. They're the direct result of a behavior that was done out of one of their beliefs that they didn't realize was driving the whole thing to begin with. So this beliefs is just absolutely the place to start. Uh, the second thing that makes clients difficult then that is related to beliefs, as are all of these down the sort of down the totem pole here, is that these clients are very easily triggered. They're very easily triggered. Now, our clinical term is that they get their schemas activated uh, pretty regularly. We usually don't use that language with patients necessarily. You know, one of the t phrases that clients will use pretty regularly is to say that, you know, so-and-so really knows how to push my buttons. So sometimes we may use that language with clients. You know, sometimes we compare it to a bruise. It's like the deeper the bruise is, the lighter the tap on your skin it takes to create a sensation. Once the bruise starts to heal, well, then it takes a little bit more to get through to it and touching it sort of makes it less reactive. But this is one of the characteristics of difficult clients is that they get triggered, they get activated very, very easily. So they've got these very sensitive buttons, these schemas, if you will, and they also have multiple maladaptive schemas. So it's very easy for friends and family members to say something that really rubs them the wrong way and sets them off. And oftentimes the person had no idea what they said or did that contributed to that. The third thing then is uh, difficult clients have extreme thinking, extreme thinking. I could talk for 30 minutes on this topic alone. Extreme thinking causes a number of different problems that we see in this client group. Probably a couple of the biggies. The first one is simply intense emotions. The more extremely we think, the more intensely we're going to feel. And intense emotions are difficult for some people to be in a room with. I mean, who likes to be in a therapy session or even having a personal life? Uh, you know, somebody who's angry all the time or threatening or there's always a violence or it doesn't have to be anger, maybe it's depression. 
I mean, one of, I have seen research that shows one of the most common therapist reactions to this population is for clinicians to actually sort of take on the hopelessness of the client, of which we need to certainly guard against. Maybe it's anxiety. I was coaching a, a psychologist the other day who's been in the field for 20 years, and she says, I still, that just that tension in the room with this population, the stress, it makes it uncomfortable for me. So extreme thinking leads to these intense emotions. Another thing that I think people maybe overlook with this population is to the extent that we engage in that, um, our clinical term is dichotomous thinking, less formally, you may hear black and white thinking or all or nothing thinking. But to the extent that we engage in that extreme thinking, we're going to have problem solving deficits. I mean, think about this for a minute. What's any of those problem-solving activities or worksheets that are out there? I mean, what's, what's the first thing that it asks people to do? Ask them to come up with three options. Come up with five options. What are some things that you could do? And then we'll look at each of them. We may examine the pros and cons. We may have you pick one and go try it and come back and let's see if it worked. If not, we'll go back to the drawing board. Well, people with this extreme thinking, they can't get past that first step. Hey, what do you mean five options? I say yes or I say no. I go or I don't. And so oftentimes they have a very difficult time generating these middle ground alternatives that are actually going to be the most effective for them. I mean, how many times you try to help a client solve a problem and, and, and you get the response, no, I couldn't try that because this. and No, that won't work because that. So it, may, it makes that problem solving issue very, very difficult with this group. Uh, the next thing that makes people difficult is uh, inflexible behavior sort of springs one from the other, but extreme thinking leads to inflexible behavior. Let's back up for a minute. If there's such a thing as a, you know, a difficult personality or a, um, you know, maladaptive, maladjusted personality, an abnormal personality, if you will, uh, there must be a such thing as a normal personality, right? <laughs> I had a client come in one time and she wore a t-shirt that said, normal is just a setting on the washing machine. It's got this crazy looking dude on it with his hairs everywhere. Looks like he stuck his finger in the socket. And in our normalizing society, it's easy to say things like that. Uh, but we really do want clients to hear. I mean, there is such a thing as normal or adaptive personality function. I love John Oldham's definition. He defines it as uh, the magnificent variety of non-pathological behaviors. And so we've got to have some flexibility in how we deal with things. I mean, the reality is that you know, we need to act differently when we are at a party than we do when we're at a funeral. And this group, at least initially, before any treatment, they just can't do that. They can't be any other way, for lack of putting it a different way. So um, the, the, behave, the way that they are is going to get them in trouble when that type of behaving is not a fit for the context that they're in. So they're inflexible behavior-wise. And the final thing is if it's not enough to have these deeply ingrained beliefs get easily triggered, have extreme thinking, intense emotions, inflexible behavior, is they don't realize any of it. <laughs> they don't get it. So, so the, the last thing here is poor insight. It's poor awareness. So because of that, this group is often very unmotivated to do anything differently. They have very little interest in being different sometimes. So we have to do a lot on that motivational front at the, at the beginning as well. So there are a few things specifically that we might refer to when we're talking about a little bit here, but more so in the upcoming two-day training, uh, what a difficult person might be defined as. Now, some people say, well, is it, uh, so this is a characteristics of a difficult person. Is that really any different in a pandemic? I mean, a lot of the same the characteristics are the same, obviously, uh, but we do have some noticeable differences. I, I think the first one, just in general, is that probably worldwide, the stress levels are at an all-time high for a lot of people. And, and any time our levels of arousal increase, our ability to process decreases, and so our, our coping skills decrease. And, and so whatever it may be for you that you might struggle with, if you're a little bit of a worrier, maybe you have a tendency to worry a little bit, if you're under a lot of stress, my guess is you're probably going to find yourself worrying a little bit more. If you have a tendency to be a little bit irritable and, and you're completely stressed out and sleep deprived, do you find yourself being a little bit more snippy with loved ones or friends or family or whatever? And, and, and so if elevated stress levels 
increase our ability to be triggered. Think how much more difficult this is for this population whose baseline is, you know, five times higher than probably most of the rest of us. So these elevated stress levels just put everybody on edge and increase their vulnerability to be triggered to begin with. You know, a second thing, and this may be the most significant, is just that due to all the restrictions, clients have limited coping options. And they can't do the things they used to could do. The client that, that going to the gym, the fitness center, and working out was always her number one coping option. Well, now that's shut down and she can't go. I have another client that would, uh, she would always go to this art gallery and she would work with clay and had this very creative outlet um, that, that was for her coping. Everything shut down with the pandemic. She couldn't go. Clients in some countries that are under complete lockdown, so they can't even leave their house and go for a drive. And so we're stuck in with more people in the house. And so these coping skills that some clients in this category don't have a vast repertoire of coping skills anyway, now have a restricted amount. And so it makes it very, very difficult for them to find some way to regulate their emotion in less destructive ways. And the other thing is simply that they're going to be triggered in different ways. And this is where it's important to know a person's mindset, to know their cognitive profile. I mean, people who have more kind of dependent traits and are very much reliant upon others to meet their needs and need those extra uh, supportive strokes and those kinds of things. If you can't get out and you can't go to your support group or you can't see family, I mean, that could be very debilitating. And so we certainly see depression rates having skyrocketed. Uh, suicide rates have skyrocketed in countries worldwide since the pandemic has started. I mean, if you're, a, if you're an avoider, if you have some of those anxiety cluster symptoms, and that's your natural tendency anyway, how much more isolated are you now during the time of this pandemic? So isolation's a really big issue. Um, a lot of people, yeah, particularly people with narcissistic traits, I mentioned that earlier, so I've got them on my mind, uh, but some people don't realize that narcissists actually have core beliefs or schemas related to being inferior. And specifically, defectiveness and emotional deprivation are kind of fancy clinical terms. And schema therapy has a concept of a schema mode. And so this group will flip into a mode that they call detached self-soother. And so alcoholism, drug abuse, pornography, gambling addiction, any of these sort of what they call detached methods of soothing oneself. And you don't have to have narcissistic traits to not be able to connect very well emotionally or with others. And so during this time of the pandemic, want to turn to substances or other external means to sort of numb out, not have to feel the emotions that they're feeling in response to the events going on around them in the world and in their communities. So, so we see alcohol abuse and other uh, substance use increase significantly during this time. So uh, I could run through a multiple different symptom sets that we could be talking about here, uh, but it's important to recognize, I think, how people are uniquely triggered differently during this time based upon their specific cognitive makeups, based upon their specific profiles. You know, one of the things that I hear a lot of therapists say is, well, I'm identifying the thought, we're challenging the thought, but the feeling's not changing. They're still anxious, so they're not doing anything different. I think one of the things that ha is happening pretty regularly there is uh, we're not getting at the thought that's most responsible for the emotional distress. So really doing a good uh, assessment, really recognizing what thought or thoughts are responsible for the emotional distress you're seeing in the moment are absolutely vital. And so recognizing how these triggers work differently in a pandemic, I think, is important. Uh, some other uh, just tips, things that are important in a pandemic uh, the, the, these first couple are going to seem pretty elementary, uh, but the first one is simply support. I think more so than anything else, more so than giving advice or telling them the right thing to do, is just to be supportive, be there for them, and help others around them if we can be there for them. Help them reach out to that support system around them. A lot of this population doesn't necessarily have a great support system to begin with. Maybe it's only one person, but, but maybe you're helping them reach out to that person, be a little more vulnerable than maybe they're comfortable being. Uh, some people aren't great at asking for help, and if that's part of their profile, really work with them on that. Really pick one person. Start small. 
but can they get somebody to be supportive? Can they get somebody to help them? Uh, so support is important. Validation is important. This sounds pretty basic as well, but I can't tell you how many, you know, well-meaning friends and family members will say things like, oh, you know, it'll be okay. You'll be okay. And first of all, they don't know that. They might not be okay. Um, and even if they are going to be okay in the long run, they don't feel okay in the moment. So just saying things like that, even though oftentimes people are very well-meaning, can certainly create this disconnect and oftentimes cause people to feel misunderstood and shut down even more so, so it's actually counterproductive. So validate, validate, validate. Sounds very simple, but very important. Another simple strategy is just amping up the self-care. I originally thought self-care is just a pretty basic thing that's taught by people that don't know anything more sophisticated. And sometimes with some of my coworkers previously, that might have been the case. But, but, but I've really come to appreciate the role of self-care and particularly dealing with these types of situations. There's a lot of different ways that you can go about practicing self-care or teaching self-care. Uh, we utilize um, a model from a resource. It's called the Road to Recovery. And we work with clients in four different areas, physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual. And, and physical might include exercise. It might include uh, keeping their medical uh, appointments and, uh, you know, and look after their physical health. It might include, uh, we do a good bit of teaching on sleep hygiene. It's actually a CBTI, CBT for insomnia, sleep protocol that we work with with some of these folks. Uh, there, there's some research out there on even nutritional neurobiology. And so really look at kind of what are the things they're putting in their body and how early and late in the day are they eating certain things. And so all kinds of elements might be incorporated in that physical. And we encourage clients to look at emotional, relational, and spiritual practices as well. There's no right way to do self-care. Uh, you might notice that a lot of those have some overlap. For those of you that are familiar with DBT, have some overlap with Lenahan's uh, emotion regulation skills, particularly her PLEASE acronym, which she talks about decreasing vulnerability for negative emotions. And so I think that's essential in a time like this when we know that increased arousal is going to make uh, an already vulnerable population even more likely to be activated, even more likely to get triggered. So anything we can do on the front end to help decrease that arousal, to help decrease their vulnerability to experience the negative emotions, I think is important. Um, it's important to have some skills to help put out the fires. So uh, I think it's important to have own a fire extinguisher, so to speak, but it's also important to do the fire education and, and, and do the, uh, uh, the, prep, the, the fire prevention education, do the preparatory work to try to keep clients from ending up in these episodes to begin with. Uh, we also just need to then, when they do get triggered, when they are in crisis, to help them sort of ride out the emotional storm. And this can mean several things. If they're actually in crisis, we're obviously needing to try to use these de-escalation skills. So things like grounding techniques, things like you know mindfulness or meditation or deep breathing strategies or sometimes even uh, exercise. So we're doing more behavioral type of things to sort of decrease that arousal level so that we can even work with them on a more rational basis. So doing those initial kind of crisis de-escalating sort of things up front is important. And then we always work with clients in terms of how they think about getting through this crisis. Uh, Lena, I guess I mentioned Linehan a couple times here. Uh, Linehan ta talks about what she calls emotional tornadoes in the population with BPD. I don't know what you guys get weather-wise over there. Growing up in Kansas, kind of Central America, I grew up in Tornado Alley, so I survived a number of different, uh, multiple tornadoes in my lifetime. And when a tornado hit, you know, everybody knew what to do. You go to the basement. You go to the basement and you protect yourself. That's it. So, I mean, nobody achieves a PhD during a tornado. Nobody proposes to the love of their life. Nobody contributes major research to the field. I mean, the goal during a tornado is simply to survive. And very similar here. We, our goal is just to survive this emotional storm. And, and so this really has to do with sort of lowering expectations in a way. Um, lowering expectations of self, we've really got a new normal that we need to adapt to. 
and we need to adapt to it cognitively as well as behaviorally. So especially for clients that have those overly self-critical thoughts that always want to put themselves down, I'm not accomplishing enough, I'm not getting enough done during this time period. If you're surviving, you're not doing anything that's, that's creating more damage during this time, uh, you're doing pretty well. Show yourself some grace. Pat yourself on the back. So expectations of self, expectations of others is important. Keeping in mind that everybody's under this increased stress level. Everybody's a little bit on edge. And so this is not the time to, you know, have a family intervention where you confront Uncle Roddy on his lifelong alcoholism. I mean, this is not the time to raise a 10-year issue, sort of marital issue with a spouse. I mean, there may be times to do those kinds of things that are better off down the road. Try to stay positive, try to focus on the positive, try to be encouraging, try to be affirming, and, and, and cut the others in your life a little bit of slack as well. So adjusting expectations of others is important. I guess another sort of mindset shift, I guess it has a little bit to do with expectations as well, but it's just sort of uh, taking on this, adopting this sort of a defensive mindset. Maybe we won't even call it like a, in schema language, a self-sacrificial mindset. So instead of this thinking about, well, you know, the government can't tell me what to do and I, I need to work to make all this money and, um, you know, I, I'm not going to make these. All right, so I'm, I'm going to go see my friends. I'm going to go out to the party anyway. Um, view, it as a, view it as a sacrifice. I mean, maybe this is an apples to apples comparison, but I've heard people talk about the worldwide war against the coronavirus. And so if we think of that metaphor as, a, as sort of this as a war, during wartime, uh, people have to make sacrifices. And so if that means for you staying at home, maybe it means staying at home. If it means your business doesn't make any money for two or three months, maybe it means you sacrifice that. Maybe it means you don't even see your family members for a while. But, but if we can get people to in, sort of embrace this mindset of sacrificing for the greater good, which most people, we can get to move in that direction. Obviously, people with narcissistic and antisocial traits, those are the two populations we have a little more difficult uh, difficulty in, in creating a movement in that mindset. But, but taking on that attitude, um, I think, can be very important. Uh, also, I'll wrap up pretty quickly here. Also, just in terms of once you've got them de-escalated, so once you've got them de-escalated, then you can use some of the standard cognitive therapy techniques. You can try to challenge some of the specific thoughts that were triggered by their specific uh, reactions to the virus, to the pandemic, to the specific trigger. Now, again, you don't want to do it until they're calmed down. It's actually one of the newer, relatively newer trends in cognitive therapy is clinicians purposefully manipulating client affect. I mean, we know that manipulating sounds like kind of a dirty word. It's not meant to be. Um, but, but we know that, that affect has to be within a certain window, okay, to be able, able to even get any significant cognitive change. So when their levels of arousal are out the rooftop, so to speak, um, that's not the time to do any sort of this cognitive restructuring. That's not the time to get them to hear anything different. So timing is really important here. But once you bring the levels of arousal down with your mindfulness, with your behavioral work, with your grounding techniques, then we can start to pick out some of the specific types of thoughts that have been triggered due to the pandemic, whether it's, uh, I'm going to lose all of my money, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills, whether it's, I literally am going to die physically from this coronavirus. We know there's a group of the population that has whether it's panic disorder, health anxiety type conditions, actually histrionic personalities have a little bit of overlap here in terms of cognitive uh, mindset. So uh, they have this sort of selective at attention to in internal, this hypervigilance towards internal stimuli, whereas, you know, you're paranoid individuals, uh, people with PTSD. I mean, a lot of conditions are hypervigilant towards external stimuli. They're always sort of scanning their environment for cues of danger. Uh, there's this group that's always scanning their body internally. And so these are people that are going to have one symptom of my temperature. I had a one degree temperature or, but no other symptoms. And they're, 
I mean, we just had a huge problem with people flooding the emergency rooms and flooding the testing centers due to a misinterpretation of bodily symptoms. Uh, certainly understandable during a time of uh, a pandemic, uh, international crisis, but these are the kinds of things that we really, once they're calmed down, we want to try to help them see some alternative explanations, try to help them challenge those thoughts and view this a little bit differently. The final thing I'll say is, and I heard, I heard Bob Leahy say this, but it's just in terms of think of your life as a book. Think of your life as a 20 to 30 chapter book. And this is just one chapter in your life. And so these different types of perspective taking interventions can be helpful. Again, once arousal is decreased, once they're capable of having these conversations and hearing these kinds of things, those per perspective taking interventions can be helpful as well. All right, well, there's a few helpful tips. I think I've hit my 30 minutes here, so I better stop rambling. I will let you know, I think they dropped the link in the chat that if you want to get my PDF on socializing clients to the cognitive model, you can do that. Uh, you can download it, print off as many copies as you want to use with your clients with no copyright issues. I've pulled that out of the book and done that. Uh, also, you get on my list to get my free tips, tools, and tidbits, I call them, uh, a couple emails a month there. So if you didn't get signed up for that and you'd like to sign up for that, and if you heard anything that piqued your interest here, certainly love to see you down the road on, I believe it's the 25th and the 26th. So come join us for the two-day seminar and look forward to getting into all this stuff in a little more depth. All right, I'm going to stop. I promised I would earlier. Thank I'll throw, throw it back to Julia or Paul. And Thank you. I'm glad to answer any questions people might have. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was fascinating. And we have quite a few interesting questions. And the first one actually came from Paul Grantham. Uh, and he asks, what do you suggest therapies do themselves to look after themselves in working with this type of clients? Now, what do, what do therapists do to look after themselves? Yeah, I mean, so I sound like a little bit of a broken record here, but self-care I think is important for the therapist as well. And, and self-care is going to be different for different people. I mean, exercise and nutrition and some of these things are pretty standard, but you know, a lot of my clinician friends are, are very artistic people and they're going to go to the ballet. Personally, I'm never going to go to a ballet, but I'm a huge sports fan. And people say, watching a football game, that's not a coping skill. Yeah, it is. I, I love that stuff. It's, it's, I mean, I enjoy watching it and it's three hours that I'm not thinking about. My mind is completely somewhere else and I don't think about a client one time. So self-care is important. I also think just I could talk a long time about this also, but how we think about clients in session. Um, they have a tendency to push our buttons when we're not prepared for this. And so people always say, oh, how do you do it? How do you work with all those borderline patients? That is probably the answer people are expecting from a cognitive therapist. But I really do think that I think about them differently than a lot of people do. I mean, I don't expect them not to yell profanity. I don't expect them not to throw things. I don't expect them not to, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's part of their condition. And so, I mean, we don't expect diabetics to come in and never have a, a blood sugar issue. That doesn't mean that it's certain behaviors are, are acceptable. Doesn't mean there won't be consequences. So I'm not even talking about behaviorally how we handle it, but in terms of taking care of ourselves, how we think about them, even as we interact with them moment to moment, uh, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Another interesting question from Irina. Can you kindly, kindly say a few pointers regarding the fourth point, spiritual? Uh, the the spiritual. fourth kind of pillar yes. in our, yes. our self-care. Well, that's, I mean, that's based upon a person's individual belief system. So, you know, we don't ever tell anybody what to do spiritually, but that's part of that four-prong template uh, that, that we work from. And if they, if they uh, don't consider themselves spiritual, they don't view it benef to be beneficial for them, then we're certainly not going to get in an arm wrestling match with anybody. They can pick and choose with, from what they want. But for some people, it might be meditation. For some people, it may be prayer or attending a service. For some people, it may just be getting out in nature. Uh, so they, they get to define what that means for them. And, and in the spiritual category, as with any of the categories, we're going to monitor for results. Um, if what you're doing is is not helping or if it's hurting <laughs> in your emotional state, then, 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 then we're going to bring it up and, and probably need to not engage in that skill and go a different direction. 
thank you thank you Anne is asking how about when you have a therapist as a client a therapist as a client right now who has major anxiety so a colleague is your client and has a major anxiety how would you handle that I mean I've had that on a couple of occasions it's 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 been a little while but I, I don't think that I handled it any differently necessarily. I mean, other than you just make some assumptions that they have some clinical understanding that most clients don't have, but it's, it's really the same process. I mean, maybe the camaraderie is a little bit different. Maybe the rapport is a little bit different, but I mean, otherwise I wouldn't treat that person as any different. I mean, I, maybe the triggers are different, but in terms of actually how you go about working with them and the mechanics of treatment, it's, you're doing the same thing. You're identifying the areas that they're overestimating risk, trying to build resources, those kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Many people asking about the list where they can get your free ebook, and I've just posted a link to that list. So basically, you click on that link, you sign up to Jeff's list, you, and you get the ebook. Correct? You click on the link, and yeah, there's no email, but you click on the link, and then it'll, it'll show up immediately for you to download. Right, yep. right, fantastic. So the link is there in the chat, and when we will uh, share the recording of this session, I will put that link in the email as well, so those who miss it in the chat can, can still benefit from this ebook. I will, I, will, I will mention that I'll, I'll give you the link to my author page also because there's actually a third book that's the Personality Disorder Toolbox. So that gives skills for not just borderline but all 10, the way we classify them now, uh, yeah. personality disorder. So I'll give you that link as well. Absolutely. If you send it to me, uh, after every session, we put the recording out and we put all this information in the news section on SDS website. And everybody here is now subscribed to SDS website. So in the news section, just keep an eye on it. There'll be a recording and all the materials which Jeff kindly shares with us, they'll be all in that news section. And we'll also send you an email with the reminder. So uh, if you keep an eye on it, you won't miss it. You'll get all the links which Jeff is kindly sharing with us. Uh, our time is almost up, Jeff. And um, it was lovely to meet you. For me, it was the first time I've met you. And uh, we are really, really looking forward to the 25th and the 26th of June. And I do heartily invite everybody to join us for those two days. Now you've met Jeff, you know what kind of inspirational speaker he is. Come and join us, and I'm sure it'll be a fantastic two days. Thank you very much for joining us from America. Uh, keep well, keep safe, all the best to your family, Jeff, and to all of you as well. All the best, and come again next Thursday. Next Thursday, it'll be Paul uh, talking on anger. And again, anger is one of his favorite topics. So next Thursday, 7 o'clock, see you here. Bye. Nice to meet you. Look forward to the 25th and 26th. Fantastic. See you guys. Bye. Take care of yourselves and stay well. Stay well. Bye. See you again.